morning, everyone. Ani Bojo, it's a privilege to be here. My name is Reverend Lee Kern, and I'm an Anglican priest in the Diocese of Toronto. I am here to do the opening this morning. I'm also the Anglican Church of Canada representative on the Kairos Steering Committee. And it is a joy and privilege to be part of Kairos, a great network of ecumen ecumenical solidarity that connects us to each other all around the world. Here, located on this land, in Turtle Island, I am on the territory of the Michi Sagig. The Michi Sagig are the southernmost nation of the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy, who have governed this land and these waters since time immemorial. The Anishinaabe made treaties with the Wendat Nation and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy to peaceably share and sustain the life of the Great Lakes caring for the land and creating contracts and treaties of peacekeeping between nations. We acknowledge those foundations of peacekeeping on this territory and the structures of intercultural relation expressed in the treaties made between these different confederacies and nations, allowing diversity of languages and practices to flourish. I acknowledge the European invasion of these territories, that military invasion bringing with it patriarchal white supremacist Christianity and greatly disrupting matriarchal leadership on this territory with military invasion. I also acknowledge the ongoing displacement of indigenous people on this very territory. Here where I am at my work, we have an encampment of people that have been internally displaced by generations of colonialism. Here at this encampment, people take care of each other and support each other through mutual aid. We help each other survive this harsh winter. I also, as I acknowledge the territory of this, this land, and Indigenous sovereign leadership over this territory, I commit us to truth telling. We renounce the genocidal practices that continue to go on, displacing people from their territories and overriding their sovereign governance and leadership over their lands and waters. I also acknowledge the impact of the transatlantic slave trade and how that theft of millions of people from the continent of Africa built the architecture of our capitalist system that we currently live under. I also acknowledge how that legacy of ex violent military extraction of people and land and water continues around the world through global practices of extraction and military invasion of indigenous territories around the world. Today is a day where we resist that legacy of extraction, where we acknowledge the power that people living in Western uh, privileged societies have that we have inherited through legacies of white supremacist practices. In this time, it is a space where we get to hear stories of courage, stories of change, where people most affected by extraction and military presence uh, over their communities get to share their stories of resistance and stories of change and courage. It's a privilege to be here together in this good way, to get to open our hearts and minds and all seek to build that strength of mutual aid and solidarity that breaks down the power binaries that continue to inflict harm and violence on our families and communities. Thank you so much to all the land defenders, defenders of each other, all the people who use their creativity to activate healing and solidarity in their communities. I offer my gratitude to you and thank you for your witness and for inviting us to listen to your experiences and build that solidarity. It is my honor and privilege at this point to introduce Jane Thiriqua. Jane is the Global Partnerships Coordinator at Kairos Canada. 
Jane is passionate about the work that supports social justice, equality, non-discrimination, and respect for human rights. She has worked within Kenya's civil society in the USA and Canada. Jane Thurkwa is a gender and women's studies graduate from York University and also an Atlas Corps and Human Rights Campaign Fellow, USA 2014. Please join me in welcoming Jane. Thank you so much, Lee. It's such an honor that you were able to join us today and start us off in a good way. And for reminding us about truth telling, uh, reminding us um, how we continue to resist as people for our land, for our water, and how all of these oppressions are connected and how we continue to resist. So thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, this is the highlight of the year for me, um, where we get to gather our partners um, and talk about their amazing work uh, that they're doing from wherever they are in the world. So I have a couple of disclaimers just before um, I get into it. Um, in the conversations today, uh, there may be some references to some triggering language or events, and we do hold space for those who may be affected by this. Secondly, because of time constraints, um, we are unable to take questions today. Uh, we appreciate that you are able to join us today, but we will not be able to take your questions for the partners. However, we do encourage you to leave some messages for our partners in the chat box, and this will be shared with them. These messages could be pledges, they could be actions that you commit to take after today um, to elevate their voices and be an agent of change yourself from wherever you are. We ask that you be respectful in the comment box. Um, if not, we will boot you out um, just so that we have a, a safe space for everybody. So today we are very glad to have with us Adriana Contreras. She is a graphic recorder and illustrator from Drawing Change Consulting. Um, Adriana is graphically not taking our meeting today. So I'll invite her to say a couple of things about the process, Adriana. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Jane. And thank you to everyone who was here this morning. Uh, my name is Adriana Contreras. Uh, I'm based on the territories of the Mosquium, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. And I'm originally from the land of the Muisca people, which is Bogota, Colombia, or known as Bogota, Colombia. Um, I uh, am part of an organization that uh, focuses on visual communication and visual storytelling. So today uh, I'll be listening to the stories um, I'll be making connections and creating a visual, um, a visual representation uh, of everything that will be shared here today. So in a moment, I'm going to switch over my camera to my canvas that I'll be using digitally. So throughout the meeting, feel free to find me in the gallery so you can see the process unfolding. And I will see you also at the end to do a recap. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Adriana. So today we're extremely grateful not only to the Kairos partners that we have here today with us, but also to our listening panel who will be sharing with us um, in the second part of today's session, their reflections on the stories of change that you're going to hear today. Um, so we are honored to have with us Carla Wayne Ruffles. She's the Director General for Inclusive Growth, Governance and Innovation Partnerships at Global Affairs Canada, uh, Partnerships for Development Innovation Branch. We also have Marie-Claude Manga. Marie-Claude is a member of the Kairos Partnerships and Rights Circle, and she has worked with us and our partners for many, many years, and we're so glad that she is able to join us today. We also have Juan Facundo. He is a youth member of the Kairos Atlantic Region Network and currently a student at Mount Allison University. Thank you so much to our listening panel. We cannot wait to hear your reflections uh, at the second part of the session today. So also noting our partners, um, we have Organización Feminina Popular or OFP from Colombia. We have Héritier de la Justice from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We have South Sudan Council of Churches National Women's Program 
and we am Palestinian Conflict Transformation, Transformation Center um, in the West Bank. So I'll give you like a general brief of the WPS program, that's the Women, Peace and Security program. Um, this program supports projects that empower and improve the lives of women through education, through skills training, through capacity building, and advancement of women's human rights through national and international justice initiatives. This program is supported by Global Affairs Canada and also individual donors, religious orders, some foundations, some Canadian unions who donate to the program and work with us for the sustainability of the program. So we are very grateful for all of the support that we receive. You know, for decades, women in these countries uh, that we work in um, and the territory have been working in the grassroots under extreme challenges of war and conflict. And they do feel the impact um, in their communities and the multitude of violence on their bodies, on their land, on their families, and in their community. Women are disproportionately affected by poverty, by violence, by environmental degradation, all of these oppressions that are connected, and they're often victims of these social exclusions. In situations of conflict and post-conflict, women can be victimized many, many times over through gender inequality, through poverty, through racism, military conflict, patriarchy, sexual violence as a strategy of war, and resurgence um, and upsurges of fundamentalism and, and conservatism in their communities. However, they are crucial agents of change. And sometimes they do this at great risk of their lives. In the current global context, as we know, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has fueled existing volatile situations for women and girls um, and intensified gender inequality, uh, increased violence uh, because of the lockdowns, um, where some women are locked in their homes with their abusers. Um, and in post-conflict um, situations uh, and the humanitarian crisis that has been created in this context, women are largely ignored, even though they're the ones who carry the burden the most in their communities. It is important to note that this October, the world marked the 20th anniversary of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325, um, and this resolution does affirm the important role that women play in the prevention and resolution of conflicts, in peace negotiations, in humanitarian response. However, as you know, it's two decades after, even though women have been doing this work for decades. Um, and despite this important progress here and there, women do continue to face gender-based violence and other global security threats such as climate change. So again, today we are extremely grateful to our partners who in their different time zones have uh, made time to come and share experiences, to share their stories, to impact knowledge. And we do celebrate their courage, their conviction as human rights defenders, as peace builders, as conquerors. You will hear from partners who work at the grassroots level and from women who through participation in um, the WPS program, have attained some leadership roles in their specific context, even though they do not really um, intended to do that uh, at the very beginning. Some of these women would identify themselves as peace builders by default, while others would say, you know, we are just going about our daily life, but they are impacting meaningful change in their community. So while each story focuses on an individual woman, it's important to remember that these individuals are just members of larger networks of women working for peace and justice and doing amazing work wherever they are. So while we do recognize that their experiences um, of gender-based violence are traumatic and they have serious consequences on women and girls, we do also recognize that these experiences do not define the individual or limit their self-agency, but rather these are pieces of a larger self-identity for these women and girls. So we do encourage you to listen, to really hear these stories of change as being transformative to these women's identities as empowered individuals. So our first speakers today are from South Sudan. Um, South Sudan for context, despite a peace agreement signed in 2015, uh, the upsurge of ethnically motivated violence um, in the country and the humanitarian situation 
um, have had women and children being the most affected by this conflict. Millions of people have been displaced internally and elsewhere, and there are more refugees in neighboring countries in millions. I will now welcome Moni Tabitha Emanuel. She's the interim coordinator of the National Women's Program of the South Sudan Council of Churches, and she will be followed by Dominica Anthony, um, who is a participant and beneficiary of the Women of Courage program. Uh, just a quick note, I note that Agnes Wasuk Petia is also on call today. Um, she's the coordinator of the women's program, um, but she is unwell. Uh, but we do thank her for joining us today and for being here uh, and will be represented today by Moni. So Moni, over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. This is Moni Tabita from South Sudan, and um, I'm here to speak on the changes or rather the advancement that has taken place from the time of imp implementation of the program in partnership with uh, Kairos Canada. Um, first and foremost, I would like to talk about um, the impact of the monthly fasting and prayers that the women have been engaging in uh, before the women uh, did not have so much unity among themselves. Like an ordinary woman, could not sit down with a parliamentarian in, a, in the same uh, room and feel like they are in the same level because they looked at parliamentarian as people of higher standards than them. But uh, when we had this monthly fasting and prayers, we come together under the same parliamentarian as mere women. So the, the fasting, uh, fasting and prayers every month has brought unity among the parliamentarians and the, 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 the women of South Sudan. And the other second impact that we have seen as the Council of Churches through the monthly fasting and prayers is that uh, we have all seen the, the prayer that we had last year in the palace of South Sudan has really created a very big impact. It is one of the reasons why today we already have the peace agreement that was signed. And the whole world can attest to it that um, South Sudan has not been like how it was before. We already are total peace, though we cannot say it's 100% sure, but at least uh, people are moving freely and the people who are in the POC can come out to participate in the monthly prayers and fasting. And another great impact that I have seen is that our women voices have been heard. Like uh, before, women did not know their right as women. They looked themselves as uh, housewives and people who could just give birth. But after getting empowerment um, through the training on the UN Security Council Resolution 1325, where it talks about the participation of women, uh, at all level, we have seen women at the grassroots who have been appointed as chiefs before. Uh, they were looking at themselves like this position belong entirely to the men. But after getting the empowerment, getting the knowledge about uh, their rights, the, the promotion of gender justice, these women have been able to participate in Western Equatoria entirely uh, where I went to conduct a training on leadership and good governance, I have seen uh, like the entire training was filled with women who are chiefs in their local areas. And they had uh, great experiences that they were sharing since they are coming into those seats, what were the impacts that they have seen through their work. Um, the other impact I would like to talk about is the awareness um, on GBV. Our women have been trained on uh, GBV, how they're supposed to support their fellow women. So the training that women receive from the South Sudan Council of Churches with the support from Kairos Canada, it has really empowered the grassroots women to come out and speak on the evil act of gender-based violence, which is being inflicted on them. It has given them the courage to come out and speak before women were scared of coming to talk about 
uh, the, the, the acts that were being inflicted on them because they looked at it like um, they, they were being blamed for whatever that was happening to them. But after our women go out and do outreach to the community, talking to the, the women about the dangers of GBV, about the importance of speaking out, it has enabled many women who are victims of GBV to come out and speak about the act that were being inflicted on them. Um, I would also like to talk about uh, the trauma. As you all know, South Sudan has been through a lot of difficult times and everybody is traumatized. But now I can say through the support that we are having from our partners, we are able to have women who are trained on psychosocial support. They're able to give the support to people out there and many of our people are getting healed from this trauma. We also have this center here, which uh, is providing counseling to people. You call in and speak about your problem and you get someone who can be able to support you in order to, to heal you from the trauma uh, <laughs> that you have been going. Um, the other thing I would like to talk about is uh, also the empowerment of women. Um, before, as I said earlier on, most women do not know their rights. But as we speak now, um, during the review of the constitution, women came out to speak about the constitution because entirely they looked at the constitution. Uh, it was lacking a lot of, um, you know, the aspect where women's rights were included. So the women uh, supported by SACC Women Link came out to speak about the review or, or review of the constitution, they need for the government to put um, some of the articles that talk about women. So these are some of the some of the changes that we have seen as South Sudan Council of Churches through the program which have been supported by the Kairos Canada. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Moni. So we are going to move on to uh, Dominica Anthony from South Sudan Council of Churches. She is a participant of the WPS program. Um, and we want to hear from her um, if she can share some insights um, about what uh, the program has impacted for her um, to share that with us today. Dominica? Oh, yes. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yes. Um, would you? To me, particular, the program has changed me in a lot of things. There are those changes that comes when we are together. We know women from other other other, other states which were not friendly to us, and from other judges that we were not united together with them. But with this program, we came to know ourselves and unite ourselves as women of South Sudan. Now we call ourselves women, women of South Sudan, not to the particular church or the particular party or particular group, but all of us are women of South Sudan. That is the impact it has given us. You go everywhere, you are known, you are a woman from this group of women link. And the women link really linked all the women in South Sudan. In our 10 state, we have executive body of women links, which shared that program with us in Juba. We know what they're doing in the, on the ground and they know what we are doing in the main office here. And the story that I want to share is when the women links started praying, the prayer which Tabita was talking about, we started praying, we went to the state especially the state of Bar el Ghazal, which is Melekal and Bor. Those are the places where the IDPs are there under the control of UN. Through this prayer, the women came out to realize that the war fought is not for them, it's not to divide them. Now they're united, the women from inside can come out, they share what they, they have in common. If others doesn't have any certain items, they bring they share it together. Anybody having a problem in the POC, those who are outside goes there. 
they shared a lot of things. So it gave me an impact that the program should continue so that we go further than what we have done. So far, we toured all the 10 states with the program of prayer and fasting and talking about trauma healing and talking about the GVV, which in our culture, some of these things are not supposed to be talked about, but through the program, we are now talking about it. If a man beats you in our culture, they say that is, that, that, that is the norm. That is the tradition. That is the love shown to a woman by beating. But with this program, women came to know how that beating is not one of the good things a man can inflict on a woman. That is her right to have a free environment for life. So the GVV program is going on even up to now as we are talking. We have women going from house to house, talking about the child marriage, the forced marriages, the earlier pregnancy. We are talking about the GVV. We are talking even about those who are overlooking the women. When talking, many are giving in, giving a positive response that, you know, we did not know that this was supposed to be like this, but now they're opening their eyes. And these programs unite really all the women from the churches and the government together. And the, at the same time, this program educate many of us, many of us have got now the skill of trauma counseling. We have, we know how even to, 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 to solve our problem. And we, we, we can also consult and counsel ourselves. And the most part now is when the COVID-19 came out, these women came out boldly talking about GVV. We have the road and market campaign. And now we are moving from house to house talking about the danger and the preventive measures and what the consequence that the, 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 the COVID-19 has brought to the community because there are a lot of bad things that happen during this COVID-19. We have children compiled in the home, they're not going to school. So there are a lot of atrocities happening to the children. Some children are, are stolen when their mother are going to look for food. Some are killed, some are raped. So a lot of things. So we are also, this program gave us an ample hand to talk about the importance of keeping the children. The child care program is there how we can keep our relationship and how we can manage with what we have. And the leadership skill also is given. So we are trained also on leadership. We are trained on trauma counseling. Though not deep, but still we have the ABCD of it, which is better than nothing. So we can do it. We are ready and we are continuing doing it. So the program itself gave us an ample opportunity of seeing things that were not seen by women and things that women does not know that it was their role. And it gave us also ample time and knowledge that women can do what men can do because our women are backward. If you go to the grassroots today, they give in easily. Though it is the right, they cannot open their mouths. Our tradition say women cannot speak in front of, of, of men, cannot discuss. But nowadays with this program, our eyes are open. We are doing it. And we say thanks to that. And we are asking that let those programs continue to open the eyes of women in the grassroots. Very few have participated. They know what I'm saying, but now, we need to go to the grassroots. There are those women there who are digging in the field. You go and fetch water, how many miles? You carry a child on your back and on top of that, you are saying nothing. So I say thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dominica, for sharing that. Uh, just a, a quick note for our listeners. Uh, there was reference to POC 
that's protection of civilian sites uh, for internally displaced persons in South Sudan. And GBV is um, gender-based violence. Thank you so much, uh, Mona and uh, Dominica for sharing that with us. Um, we will move on now to um, our partners in Colombia. Um, in Colombia, despite the peace accord uh, that was signed in 2016, the country continues to experience uh, humanitarian and human rights crisis because of the prolonged conflict. There has been spikes in attacks against the human rights defenders and those who are working for the implementation of the peace accord. I'm, I'm trying to go slower so that the translators don't miss anything. Um, so uh, we have heard reports from the OFP that since the accord uh, was signed, over 300 social leaders have been assassinated. Um, and I would like to remember and honor the life of Carlota Isabel Salinas Perez. She was a member of the OFP and she was attacked and killed in March um, of this year. So we remember her life uh, and may she rest in power. According to the OFP, the, this rise in violence against women is fueled by misogyny and patriarchy that is stigmatizing women human rights defenders and peace builders who are promoting critical peace efforts. I will now welcome Gloria and Paro Suarez, uh, the leadership team of Organización Feminina Popular uh, in Colombia, and she will be followed by Isabel Caistendo, um, a participant and beneficiary of the WPS program. Uh, Gloria, I pose the same question to you. In your context in Colombia, what changes have you seen in communities that you work that have significantly impacted your work at the OFB? Welcome, Gloria. Bueno, buenas a todas y a todos. Muchas Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Kairos, for your support. What we've seen here is the intensification of gender violence. We've seen that the number of cases of gender violence have increased during the pandemic. We've also seen that assassinations, murders of leaders of both men and male leaders have increased. And we've also seen an intensification of humanitarian crisis and impoverishment of women. Women are the heads of these households, which have to look for alternative solutions. And during this time, that has been very difficult given the pandemic. Now, in terms of significant changes, I have to say that we're profoundly grateful for Gaidos for your support during this program, Women of Courage. And I'd also like to say thank you for giving us the opportunity to find a way to continue forward with the project because this project was supposed to have taken place through workshops with women face to face. And we're very grateful for the support we received to now be able to work in these new modalities to work virtually. Thank you so much for your patience and for facilitating support so that we could adapt. Our learning has been absolutely essential in learning for the women in terms of how to work with internet connections, with Zoom, with virtual tools so that we can continue our work. The training for women has made it possible to empower them, not only so that they can learn about their rights, but right now, in such a difficult situation, this has played a key role these women are in situations of isolation. So by having access to these skills, by being, having access to accompaniment, circles of protection, prevention of femicide, we're also working with counseling. It has 
helps us to identify which women are at risk of femicide. And we see that women have become empowered and have received training. It, this has been an essential part of our work. It's the women who let us know, for example, to say a certain women is going through this kind of experience. They took her phone away. They're not letting her to communicate with anyone. And we're talking with the neighbors about how to make this more visible. They're the ones who notify us. And this has helped us to save some women's lives. Unfortunately, in some cases, we've had to remove women from the sites where they were located. I, this was important because we saved their lives and the lives of their children. But in any case, we have to move them out of their context. We have to move them to another city. And that's not ideal, but that's sometimes the only way that we can save that woman's life. This program has also helped us to have better communication with the authorities. And many women who have received training have been able to call the police in the middle of the night and say, I'm part of the organization, I'm a leader, and this is what's happening here with the women, and we need you here present with us. And there we have a network of accompaniment and we can call different women. But it's been possible for the police and women to arrive at one in the morning, and they have support through that network of support and help, and they've made it possible for authorities to be present when they need them. Those situations have been very important examples in the development of this program. We've also been able to talk about new masculinities, new behaviors of men. We've talked about protection of women. Women, for example, who say at midnight and we're four women here protecting a woman and we're up here and it's raining, but we're not going to leave until we know that she's going to be safe. The work, this accompanying work and this program has been very important. It's been a very important source of support, not only for the empowerment of women, but also to expand protection and create safe spaces for women, especially circles of protection and preventing femicides. I'll stop here to let Isabel speak, and then if there are any questions, you can let us know in the chat. Isabel says, good morning, everyone. I'm very grateful to have been invited to participate here today on behalf of OFP, and we're very grateful for the support that Gaidos has given us, and we're also grateful for the opportunity to participate in this program and to help each other. We work with women that are suffer violence and abuse. I would like to say that as a result of the training that we have received through Kaido's support, we have become empowered. We have learned about laws. For example, 1250, Law 1257, which references the protection of women. We have participated in campaigns. One of those campaigns focuses on protection. We have participated in important campaigns to accompany women when they have suffered violence, such as Gloria was saying, women that are alone and defenseless, but that as a result of this group of women that we have formed through the training, we are united and we are in touch with women and we're able to provide accompaniment, legal accompaniment, psychological accompaniment.
We have access to counseling and legal support. We have also organized campaign. There's a campaign called Juntas Nos Cuidamas. We take care of ourselves. Yesterday, we had a very strong campaign. All the women were present to commemorate November 25th, the International Day Against Violence Against Women. And this training that we have received, we're very grateful for it. It gives us strength every day. It gives us tools to be able to help women. And in spite of everything that is happening with the pandemic, where we've seen an intensification of violence, the situation is critical for women as a result. We truly are very, very grateful for Kairos and for all the people who have provided support. This empowerment is tremendous, tremendous. We hope it will continue because there are many women, many women who are interested in this process. Here in Colombia, violence against women. Every day, there are more women who are victims of violence. And now with COVID, it's even worse. What else can I say? Well, thank you. Thank you for the training. Thank you for the workshops. This has helped us to create change in our communities. Thank you for the accompaniment. Thank you for the circles of protection for women. Now we know where we have to go to, who we have to contact, how we can report incidences of violence so that women can create reports and how we can accompany them in that process. All of this is very important. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Isabel and Gloria, for your share today. Um, we do acknowledge that uh, women do this work under great risk, um, and we appreciate for them being at the forefront um, of continuing this work, um, despite the challenges. Um, we will now move to Eretia um, de la Justice. Um, I hope that they're able to hear us clearer now. Um, so for just a bit of context, um, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, according to the United Nations Security Council, um, some 4.5 million people have also been internally displaced there. Um, over 1 million women and girls have been victims of extremely brutal and widespread sexual violence, permanent displacement, kidnapping, um, have been reported to human trafficking um, and the proliferation of foreign and local armed groups, especially um, uh, in conflicts over exploitation of mineral resources. The DRC is quite rich in natural resources. So we will hear today from two Chantals uh, from uh, DRC. Uh, first, we'll have Chantal Bilulu, who's the program coordinator for women and children with Ratier de la Justice. Um, and then we will hear from Chantal Bahoya, who's a participant uh, and beneficiary of the program. So I now introduce Chantal in five minutes. Hello. Um, I introduce Chantal. Share with us, uh, share with us uh, the significance uh, of the importance of your work that has kept you motivated uh, to keep moving forward in courage. Hello, everyone, buddy. Welcome to all partners from the Courage Program. In the Congo, everything that we have experienced, um, the impacts of the war and the impact on women and young girls. With this war, the women were the primary victims. This 
militarization was greatly impacted by a lot of armed groups. Um, national groups, guerrilla groups. So these armed groups means that these women were very much impacted by sexual violence and gender-based violence. So in terms of gender-based violence, the women were impacted in their areas of work, uh, sexual exploitation, so they are coming in either pregnant or with illnesses or dying as a result of these this violence and then for their families, um, after these experiences of rape and sexual violence, they often experience rejection from their families. People that they cannot, you know, they, they're rejected by their families. They can't live with them. And so being able through these programs to get access to medical and psychosocial support has been enormous. So these government and military groups that are creating violence, there's also gender-based violence. That is taking place. Right, that are taking place just at a community village, a community level, you know, that they don't have the right to have uh, grounds, like the land ownership, um, women not having access to the right to voice and opinion, that they are completely at the mercy of men and even young girls uh, with relation to their education and access to education. So for girls from second primary to secondary school, the numbers are reducing in terms of girls that are actually getting access to education. So it's either that there needs to be work, you know, the, the women are either needing support with work at home or they're needing to go into the fields and the young girls are being asked to stay at home and tend to the house. So doing domestic, you know, various domestic responsibilities. Right, so girls are not able to follow through with their education, even if at one point they had begun. A lot of the customs here says that women cannot speak in front of men, that it's not her place to speak in front of men. Yeah, where there's decisions being made in the village. There's no place. There's no place for their voice, no value placed to them and their experiences and their their wisdom. They're ex excluded. Mem, when it's issues that have to do with them and it has to do with their own experiences, they, there's no place for their voice. So the women and the young girls, they have to stay in the kitchen. These decisions are being made without them. And so, thankfully, due to this project, it has given us the opportunity for women and young girls to galvanize and bring greater awareness for the rights of women and girls at a national level and, and, and the importance of their rights. 
getting to do sensitization and new information sharing about the human rights, peace, the rights of children, rights around peace, um, equity, speaking about the importance of women, the value of women, and then being able to speak to authority that women have rights. That to place women outside of what is important is, 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 is never going to work. It will not lead us to peace if we keep excluding, excluding women. That women are critical to the solutions that are being sought in terms of the peace building that is taking place. They need to be a part of these meetings. They have a clear role. They know how to play it. They have their voice uh, in, in, in the face of authority. They have things to share that are important. And so, Hérité de la Justice is creating the chance for these, these voices to be heard. Thank you so much, Chantal. Um, I couldn't have said it better um, about how women are disrupting the norm um, and being at the forefront of elevating their voices in the fight for their rights. Malekera avec sa femme dans le quartier. La femme a saisi aussi et il était venu suivre aussi la sensibilisation. Et après la sensibilisation, elle est venue nous voir dans notre bureau. Nous aussi, comme bénéficiaires du projet Femmes, Père, Femme, Père, Courage et Sécurité, nous sommes allés chez la famille là-bas et on est allé voir les maris et sa femme. On a essayé de conseiller concernant comme tout le monde et l'homme aussi a jugé bon de changer. Parce que so les... that there was change in the whole family, including the, the man of the household. There was a strong issue of alcoholism in the family. But after receiving counsel from us, he started to change his behavior as well as a result of, of coming into contact with, with our programming. And so the kids who were not accessing education before are now going to school and receiving education. There's been a big shift in the family, in, in the relationship within the family and the safety and opportunities. I wanna thank Kairos around the work that's being done around women's rights children's rights. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chantal. So we're now going to move to We Am. Um, and for context, so the Israeli-Palestinian relations remain tense um, and international efforts to revise negotiations have failed over the years with Israel continuing to develop illegal settlements on territory it occupies. There are now over 500,000 settlers in the West Bank. Almost 40% of the West Bank consists of settlements, military bases, and other Israeli controlled areas. In these times of political and economic turmoil, oftentimes it is the women who feel this harsh economic, social, and cultural impacts of this occupation, as well as now the rise of conservative, patriarchal extremist groups within the Palestinian society. So we were supposed to um, have heard from Lucy Talger, who's the uh, women's coordinator at WIAM, but she unfortunately called in this morning ill. Uh, she, she's feeling unwell. So in her place, we will have uh, Tarek al -Zugbi. Tarek is the youth and project coordinator at WIAM. Um, so we will ask you the same question, um, Tarek, in your context. What impacts you have seen uh, of the program and working with uh, beneficiaries and women uh, all around the West Bank 
um, uh, if you can share that with us. And we will hear today from two beneficiaries uh, at the WIAM Center, uh, Nazreen Hajizin and Loretta Lama. But first to Tariq. Thank you so much, Tariq. Um, first of all, it is great to be here with you. And it's especially great to be able to be gathered by four different continents via Zoom with this meeting in support of justice and specifically, uh, um. as you can see, we're a little bit small in number and that is because tomorrow will be the new wave of lockdown because of the rise in the number of COVID cases that we have been experiencing. So since the start of the COVID pandemic, uh, Bethlehem and the Palestinian territories entered into a lockdown. During this time, we saw a sharp rise in unemployment with Bethlehem having the greatest in the West Bank reaching around over 80%. This also, as a consequence, caused great food insecurity and further poverty margin to the marginalized community. And we saw as a result, a rise in domestic violence and domestic abuse and in violence in general. So since then, we am has been active and continuing the work in WES with a special focus on conflict mediation and mediation as well as psychosocial support for women and families and for the community. But Throughout the years, and thanks to the support of Kairos and with partnership with Kairos, WIAM has been able to continue its work with women and women empowerment. Mm -hmm. And through yeah, this, we have... Um, so one of the things that we try and measure is women's participation and ability to participate in the political processes, but also in civil society. One of the things that we have seen over the past three works with our work with Kairos mm -hmm. is increased confidence rates. And this isn't just the ability to speak, but it's also the way that people feel that their voices are heard and that there is this place for their voices to be heard. And this also includes the ability to interrupt during conversations, the ability to come and exude passion and speak passionately, but it's also the ability to speak about contentious topics that are important. As a result, one of the things that came out just a few months ago was this new campaign in Bethany, one of the most conservative areas of the West Bank, against sexual harassment. And of course, this is a topic that is generally very difficult to talk about and taboo in society. But through this program and through the work that we am has been able to do, we have been able to establish this campaign and we've had women participate and take the lead initiative on this. Another thing is we've had different organizations and different networks. We're currently working in eight different communities across the West Bank. And we are currently in the finalizing processes in one of the communities of establishing a civic society organization for women. And that is a way to take the work that we am has been able to do in these different communities and transfer more formally ownership over this program and project. So that work towards gender justice, towards women empowerment isn't just coming from WEAM, but it's also coming from the training of trainers programs that WEAM does. It's coming from the women in these communities and they're able to take ownership and increase the longevity and sustainability of these programs. The other thing that we are seeing is when it comes to political participation, we are hopeful that we will be having new elections within the coming year or two years. And there is a new call that we continue to receive from schools, from universities, and even from municipal councils asking us as a center to help network with them and do some gender sensitivity training and some gender justice mainstream, mainstreaming and training with them so that we are able to assure more effective participation of women in local politics and national politics. And maybe to give you a bit more of the programs that we have, we have some of the beneficiaries who would like to speak and share about their experience with us. So we have Loret Emilias, then we have Nasreen, and we have Samah. So I will transfer the mic to them. I am Lorette from Bethlehem. 
من المشاريع اللي بناخذها في المركز نحن هون في مركز وئام غيرت حياة نساء كثير بدعم وتقوية وتمكين المرأة through the support and the empowerment of women. لدينا مشاركات في عدة ندوات. We have participated in many conferences. ورشات عمل. And workshops. ومؤتمرات. And conferences that take place through this program. يوجد لدينا تدريبات في داخل المركز وخارجه. We have trainings inside the center and outside it. في قضايا العنف وحل النزاع بين الأولاد and conflict resolution. ومواضيع تخص المرأة ومواضيع أخرى. And issues concerning women and other issues. ونستفيد من اللقاءات من هنا بناء على الاستفادة من التدريبات واللقاءات based on what we have learned in the trainings and the meetings أصبحت أنا جزءا من الحركة النسوية I'm part of the feminist movement وعضو في لجنة الإصلاح التي تتكون من رجال ونساء of the reform committee that has women and men المشاكل التي تتعرض لها المرأة. The problems that women face. That women face. في البيوت وخارج البيوت. Homes and outside homes. ساعد هذا المركز في نشر الوعي حول كوفيد تسعة عشر. Around violence against women. وساعد في تقديم المعونات العينية والمادية. And it has helped. Given material and other kinds of help as well. شاركنا في عدة حملات لمناصرة ودعم المرأة. We have participated in many campaigns to help and advocate women's rights. وكان عندنا نشاطات وحملات كثيرة في هذا المركز. And we had a lot of campaigns and activities take place in the center. شاركنا أيضا في حملة 16 يوم للقضاء على العنف. Also we participated in the campaign for 16 days to end violence against women. حيث النوع الاجتماعي وخصوصا للمرأة. ونحن الآن. Based violence and specifically against women. ونحن الآن في صدد مساعدة وتوفير فرص عمل للعائلات المحتاجة. Trying to support and provide work opportunities for our families. سواء كان بأعمال طبخ أو أعمال أو أي شيء تقوم بها النساء or other activities or work that women can do مرحبا أهلا بكم أنا بحب أشكركم على دعوتكم إلنا في هذا الحفل I to thank you all for inviting us over we can keep trying we are from the village of Thabra تعرفنا على مركز وئام تقريبا من ثلاث سنوات. We got to know the WM Center through. That wasn't clear. تعلمنا كثير من اللقاءات والمحاضرات التي قد قدمت لنا عن طريق مركز وئام. We learned a lot through the meetings and the workshops that took place through the WM Center. زادت ثقتنا بنفسنا. We are now have more. We are more confident. تعرفنا على الكثير من المجموعات الأخرى. We got to meet with many other groups. مختلفة وثقافات متعددة. From different cultures. أيضا قمنا من خلال مركز وئام بالعديد من اللقاءات. Also through the WM Center, we have witnessed a lot of meetings. تعرفنا على اتفاقيات كنا لم نعرفها. مثل اتفاقية تي داون التي تنص على قضاء على جميع على قضاء على جميع أشكال التمييز ضد المرأة. 
we learned about a lot of different uh, conventions and agreements, including the ones concerning and the all kinds of violence against women. Also, also we had meetings about how to deal with the corona pandemic. They helped us to create a women's association in the village. We could support our rights as women in that village. Also, we got to learn about Security Council Resolution 1325 about the role of women in security and peace. We worked on a small project on um, basket weaving from straw to increase families' incomes. And I give the microphone to my friend. from the Sabra village. أنا بدي أحكي شوية عن دور المركز معنا كنساء في هذه القرية. The role of the center as women of the village. قام المركز بالعديد من اللقاءات والنشاطات. The center staged a lot of meetings and activities. اللي تعرفنا على على من خلالها على اتفاقية سيداو. Which we learned about the Sidao agreement. التي تنص على القضاء على كل أشكال العنف ضد المرأة. Which uh, uh, is about ending all kinds of violence against women. كانت كل اللقاءات تقريبا تتمحور حول المشاركة المجتمعية. All the meetings were mainly about community participation. والمساءلة. And also about, about uh, bringing those who are responsible for uh, certain actions into the justice system. Also, we had an initiative to clean the village and solving the water problem. وأيضا قمنا ونقوم بالتشبيك مع المؤسسات أخرى لدعم قضايانا في القرية. Also we coordinated with other institutions to solve our problems in the village. إحنا بنؤمن إنه التمكين الاقتصادي للمرأة. We believe that the economic empowerment of women. يقلل من فرص العنف ضدها. Reduces chances of violence against them. ومن هذا المنطلق. And through that, we asked the WM Center to have workshops to Based on that, we asked the WM Center to have workshops to empower women economically. Through the straw basket weaving workshop that took place. We also formed a group of women. وقد استهدفنا فئات الشباب من الصبايا. And we targeted young women and girls. وأنشأنا جمعية نسوية. And we created a women's association. لتطوير القرية التي تعاني من مشاكل كثيرة. To develop the village which suffers from a lot of problems. وبدأنا بتقديم ورشات عمل. And we started to have workshops. ولقاءات لتوعية المرأة وتثقيفها وتعريفها بحقوقها وشكرا لكم of the third one. I'm, I'm sorry about that. But thank you so much for sharing that with us. 
So we're going to move on to the second part of our session where we will welcome uh, our speaking, our listening panel. Um, so we will hear first from Marie-Claude Manga um, and then Carla and, and then Juan uh, at the end. So quickly about Marie-Claude, um, she's a member of the Kairos Partnerships and Rights Circle. She's a social worker at Quebec Provincial Local Community Service Centre in Montreal, uh, working with, among others, immigrants, families, integration and adaptation to Canada. Marie-Claude has been on two Kairos' delegations, one to the DRC in 2013 and one to the Philippines um, in 2014. She's also an ordained United Church of Canada minister at Mount Royal United Church in Montreal. Um, Marie-Claude, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, in five minutes, please share with us what your reflections are uh, from the stories that you have heard today um, and how you intend to continue with this accompaniment and commitment. Alors, merci, merci, merci beaucoup. Thank you, thank you so much. Je suis encore très émue par uh, tout ce que j'ai entendu, alors je préfère... I am just still so grateful for all that I have heard. I, I listened with a lot of attention to the presentations based on your life experience and, and the experiences that women and young girls who are living in fear and who experience so many different impacts at their in their communities. What hits me the hardest is the similarity in these situations and, and the challenges that these women are facing, that you're facing in your respective contexts. While I was listening to you, I was making links in my head, in my mind. The, the, the precarity of the situation of women in this time, at this time. When my dad's, when I was young, my dad used to say, you are, right, you are someone whole. We are working towards a, a vision of, of, of women as whole. So what has happened, whether it's in the countries of the south or that the, of the south or of the uh, of the north but that the issues of women are, are are not being respected more and more women are living in precarious situations more and more women facing violence who are victims of exclusion. Women, like children are being killed as a way to, to punish women. Like what's, what's happening? What's happening? I'm so impressed by the profoundness of your experiences and the courage that you are showing in the middle of all this, uh, uh, in the middle of violence of war, of sexual violence, military violence. Sorry for saying this, but I'm gonna say, when I was a little girl of 18 months, I was hospitalized for being sexually abused or being abused. What, what is going on? In the North, we have the chance to denounce. Even if it keeps happening, we can go and get support and denounce these acts and to get community support. 
and that we have justice systems that, that, that function. Mais dans le sud, but in the south, from what I'm hearing, what I just heard, you know, there's there's still hope. Vous êtes là um, and there's still lots of hope, but there's still the, the situation is, is, is much more constrained. And you're doing so much. You're all doing so much to respond to these situations. To, to find processes for healing. Congratulations. Bravo for for your effort in in, in, in finding a way through this and, and to those men that are supporting, that are also willing to support. My dears, for every woman and young girl who is impacted, you are a source of inspiration and hope. And I say thank you. Thank you for being available for your commitment. Thank you for all that you do. For responding to these insecure conditions and militarized conditions. Your efforts offer empowerment to these young girls to play and for these women to be able to provide opportunities for their girls and to have the chance to actually denounce this violence and to live with dignity. I'm going to finish with this. I was sharing a bit about my experience of my travels to the Philippines in a region that is has similarities to your context. And a question was asked of me. How were you in these areas that were so militarized and that you were not afraid? Okay, I won't go into all the details, but I said, there are people who are there, who are intervening, who are doing things. It is it is worth the effort to, to go and, and, and see them. So you're talking about women who have sacrificed their lives, you know, for this work that they do. You know, that are there to protect the lives of, of young girls, of women of the communities. My final words, my last sentiment. It, it takes just one seed for a forest to grow. And so that you are that in your communities, you are the seed of hope. Continue your efforts for it will ripple outward. It creates change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marie Claude. Thank you for your vulnerability with us, for your remarks, and we do hold space for you in power and solidarity. Thank you so much. We'll now move to Carla Hogan uh, Ruffeld. Um, it's a great pleasure to have you with us on our panel. Uh, Carla is currently the Director General for Inclusive Growth Governance and Innovation Partnerships in Global Affairs Canada's Partnerships for Development Innovation Branch. Since joining the Canadian International Agency, CEDA, Development Agency CEDA in 1995, Carla has served as forestry advisor, senior project officer, and as manager in CEDA and GACS policy, global issues and development, partnership, Asia and America's branches. From 2016 to 2019, she was the high commissioner for Canada to the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Carla was the government of Canada representative at the Canadian Embassy to Nepal between 1999 and 2003, 
and prior to joining the Government of Canada, she worked at the Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome um, in 1992 1993 as both an international forestry consultant and volunteer between 1983 and 1990. Carla, gender equality and empowerment of women and girls is a key action area in Canada's feminist international assistance policy. Indeed, the Kairos WPS project with our partners is supported by GAC. What are your reflections on how we can continue to work together to support this work and other priorities of, um, and policies at GAC? Thank you uh, very much. So, well, first of all, thank you very, very much for inviting me to, uh, to participate in this, uh, in this learning and listening session. It's really been, uh, it's such a privilege really and, and a luxury to, uh, to be asked to listen. And, uh, and I feel very, very, um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. And I'm also very, very humbled by, uh, by, by what I've heard this morning. Um, and I agree very much with, um, with Muddy Claude's observations of the, the shared challenges um, across, the, uh, across such different contexts, right? Across such different parts of the world. And uh, it really, uh, really builds a solidarity, uh, a global solidarity, I think, uh, amongst us all. Um, I wanted to touch, um, as was mentioned, um, we have, uh, Canada has the Feminist International Assistance Policy, and we're striving to play a leadership role on issues of gender equality, women's empowerment, and sexual health and reproductive rights, in, in, uh, among other, uh, other things. Um, we really believe that civil society organizations, including faith-based organizations, play an essential role in advancing the objectives of the Feminist International Assistance Policy, as well as the goals, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. So um, it's indeed inspiring to hear your personal stories and to also better understand the the impacts and the, uh, the results that are being achieved through um, about, um, as we're about halfway through implementation of the, of the Women, uh, Peace and Security program with Kairos. Um, the, the Women, Peace and Security program is key to ensuring that women have full voice and presence in peace and reconciliation processes. And, um, and your, what you've spoken about this morning is, has really underpinned that. Um, I'd like to, uh, uh, I, I'd like to, um, to stay within my time to, to quickly go to what I, what I heard this morning. And I really think the results um, can be bundled in three areas from what we heard across the four, uh, the four, um, the presentations from the, from the four different geographic areas. Um, I would say that the three, the three kind of bundles are uh, number one, breaking down barriers. Number two is voice and empowerment. And number three is awareness and action. So, um, so under breaking down barriers, um, you know, I was really struck across the board. Every every one of the presentations that we heard talked about um, about this aspect of building bridges between um, between women and between different government organizations and women's organizations. Um, for example, uh, the South Sudan example of. Um, you know, united as women of South Sudan and the bringing of parliamentarians and, uh, and S South Sudanian women together um, to dialogue, how powerful that is, that is as an example. Um, in Colombia, for example, the better communication with authorities and, uh, and police. And in the DRC, the, uh, 
the national level awareness of the rights of women and girls and children and the need to include women in peace uh, building processes. And then in the West Bank, the, uh, the work that's going on, you know, the combined and joined up efforts of working uh, with other, or with a number of different organizations to solve problems at, um, in particular, I heard this morning at the community level, but various kinds of problems, problems related to, to um, addressing uh, sexual harassment, but also issues around around the environment, pollution and, and water. So, um, you know, that, you know, the breaking down barriers is a key takeaway for me this morning. The second one being voice and empowerment. And, um, you know, with a real, you know, you, you so well articulated um, the, the so what behind training. You talked about the training in human rights and in laws um, regarding the protection of women, um, but how that how that led to or has led to empowerment, which has increased the participation of women in um, in discussions and dialogue on uh, on the constitution, for example, in South Sudan. Um, it's increased. Uh, uh, leadership skills, um, and it has um, it has increased the role of uh, of women in peace building, as I mentioned in the DRC, and also political participation in uh, in the West Bank. So really, um, you know that the uh, increased voice, um, uh, confidence leadership and empowerment, you know, that big basket of results. And then finally, the awareness and the action. And, um, you know, uh, the, you know, the, the, you know, I was really struck by, especially the, um, the honesty and the, uh, and, and the gravity of, of the, the stories that we heard this morning. Um, and stories is too light of a word, but about the the issues around uh, the gender-based violence and and violence against women and children, um, the, uh, the the barriers to access to education, um, the uh, issues around uh, around land rights, for example. Um, but on the other hand, so the awareness and how and how that voice and empowerment is leading to greater awareness, but also action. Um, so the work that, uh, you know, the participation in campaigns, for example, against gender-based violence, um, the, the support that's being given to, um, to address trauma, to help, uh, to help uh, uh, families and, and communities and individuals deal with trauma um, the cycles, the psychosocial support that's being provided, and um, that accompaniment, um, you know, accompanying individuals and families to address um, systemic uh, challenges, um, to that will then result in long-term change um, within families and within communities. So. Um, I'll just, I think I've probably come to, to, to the end of my time frame, but I really wanted to reflect uh, those, those, those key areas of results and impacts that I, that I heard you talking about this morning in, uh, in, in your presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carla. Um, and we do look forward to our continued collaboration with GAC. So last but not least, we welcome Juan Facundo, who is among others, a Kairos Atlantic, Atlantic Region Network member. Juan is currently a student at Mount Allison University, finishing an honors degree in philosophy with a major in politics, philosophy and economics. He's the president of the Amnesty International chapter at Mount Allison 
and was awarded the L.R. Wilson Internship this summer, where he worked with the Organisation Feminina Popular on their first ever crowdfunding campaign to amplify the voices of women in Barrancabeja uh, through their up and coming community radio station. He currently resides in the traditional unceded territory of Volostokini and a Mi'kmaq people and is considering a career in law to fight within the system for a more transparent, feminist, Black, Indigenous, people of color friendly decolonial state. When young people are not only uniquely affected by gender-based violence, war and conflict, but they are also crucial in effecting positive transformi transformative change. Based on what you had today, what are your reflections, including perhaps the involvement of youth in the movement against gender-based violence and involvement of men at that? Okay, thank you. Um, well, first, I uh, just want to thank everybody for uh, for being here, and uh, you know, everybody that shared their story. It was uh, it was very powerful. Um, so, yeah. So the, the the there's kind of like three three uh, big branches that I saw um, throughout the stories, uh, as well as as Carla. Um, and and this kind of this reminded me of a story that uh, of a interview that I, I heard um, uh, from uh, from Gloria uh, of the OFP, uh, where she talked about like the the necessary um, response to fear and to kind of patriarchal logic, um, and this is one of the like one of the big themes that I thought that I thought I saw uh, throughout the, all of the the stories, which was uh, as soon as there was communication between women, um, these this fear was was kind of um, confronted uh, with solidarity, and uh, and that way it was it was surpassed. Um, so that was one of the biggest uh, kind of things that I saw uh, throughout the the stories, um, and how communication between women. Um, is fostered through the the kind of uh, programs that Kairos and Global Affairs Canada and other other um, institutions are able to to bring forward, and so that's um, that's really amazing because if, if they don't have that avenue, um, then those kind of conversations aren't aren't able to happen. Um, so there was a there was kind of a a change that I saw um, from an inner trauma uh that that women have um and then that inner trauma being uh you know uh s s dealt with uh through the communication um in these in these kinds of workshops and in these kinds of um uh actions uh between women and then uh that then led these women to have the courage to um deal with their private uh, trauma of, of gender-based violence, um, and 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 change the type of patriarchal logic that that a lot of uh, men have within these communities, um, and then that in itself then led to kind of a wider public um, denouncement of of you know white supremacy, um, kind of uh, inequalities uh, or structures of power that are. That are suppressing women, and so the, that kind of approach um, from the grassroots, I think, is really important, and um, and it starts with with this kind of empowerment of women, uh, and how 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 does that uh, help, um, or how can the like youth uh, change that? I think I think just the examples that they're seeing uh, in their household and, and in these networks of care. Um, are the are the kind of uh, important facets of, of of changing their minds and um, and 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 kind of being a role model to to the to to up and coming generations. I think that every uh, you know up and coming generations are very open to to this type of um, change that is happening um, within women's. Um, inner inner psyche and also uh with with the inner psyche of of the of the society as a, as a whole 
And so, um, yeah, I, those were the, the, the three kind of uh, moment or branches that I saw. It was communication, uh, the allow, you know, the allow um, women being allowed to speak to each other and being uh, having those uh, resources, and then the transformation um, of, of norms and hierarchies and, and empowerment of, of of a new social order. Um, so, so I think that um, we just have to be really grateful for these women um, and the way that they're able to transform societies from even though societies have been um, suppressing them for so long and that uh, this fight keeps on going on and, and thanking uh, institutions like Kairos and Global Affairs Canada to, to um, facilitate that transformation. Thank you so much, Juan, for your service, for a different voice uh, in all of this mix. We appreciate that you were able to be here with us. Um, so we are heading towards the end of our session today. We might go a little bit over um, the time. We might not, not be able to finish at noon um, because we are running a little bit uh, behind. Um, and uh, partners in South Sudan have had to leave. Uh, it's heading to 8 p.m. their time. Um, and there, there might be uh, security reasons because of um, uh, curfews because of COVID-19. So we do appreciate the South Sudan Council of Church members for being here with us. Uh, unfortunately, they couldn't stay on um, to the very end. So we are going to hear some closing remarks from our partners. We will invite one representative from each of the organizations to uh, give us their closing remarks. Um, and truly this, these are just a message from them, uh, a message to Canadians and to the Canadian government um, based on what you have heard today uh, moving forward and, and what your projections are uh, with this project moving forward. So we'll start with uh, Sylvia Yanez from the OFP. Um, Sylvia, welcome. Hola. Hi, everyone. On behalf of the OFP, I think today's meeting gave us a greater understanding of all the shared challenges that we have in different organizations around the world. There are many points and aspects that we have in common, and it helps me have a better understanding about the importance of women's fight for justice and for defending life. For us, it has been very important to make our work visible. And I think everything that has been said today about what we do and the impact that it has on individuals makes it helps it to be more visible as organizations and as women our focus on care on protection and on security it helps us achieve well-being a state of well-being where we can protect life and this is something we can achieve in spite of lockdowns and the chaos and the pandemic. And even though there are a lot of doubts and uncertainty during this pandemic, we're still hopeful. We're still hopeful to keep moving forward. And we're hopeful that we will see progress around the world. And we are very grateful for the help we received from Kairos and from the government of Canada. And what stands out the most for me from these gatherings is to see the butterfly effect, how one action can have a small impact in a one community. We see it at a local level, but at the same time, 
repeats, it replicates, it expands in other places, places that I've never been to personally, but that, that feel very close and dear to my heart. And it's, this feels like a global home, like a shared land amongst all of us. And therefore, I'm very grateful for Gaidos and for the Canadian government. We're grateful to have this opportunity to hear experiences from all over the world. It encourages and motivates our hope and our momentum and our impulse to continue doing the work that we do. Our work sorry. has to continue. I'm so sorry, Sylvia. I'm going to have to interrupt you in the interest of time. I'm, I'm so sorry, but thank you for your remarks. Um, we will move now to Ertier de la Justice. Uh, is Gerald or Chantal who is making a final remarks? And please try to keep it to about a minute each in the interest of time. Okay, je remercie Kairos pour cette occasion. I want to thank Kairos for this occasion to be able to share with other partners about the change that we are experiencing. And where everyone has the opportunity to share what they have been doing to create impact. And seeing that together we're making a change. We're having an impact on the rights of, of, of women. In this program of Women, Peace and Security, Thank you to Kairos and the government in Canada. We see that our actions are like snowballs, that they are small and, and are growing and having greater impact. We are reinforcing the capacity of our beneficiaries um, and upholding, uplifting the rights of women. Thank you to our partners at Kairos, the Women, Peace and Security Program. And for me, there is no development without peace. We need peace for development. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Merci. Asanti. Asanti sana. Thank you to Global Affairs Council. <laughs> right uh and now to we um we we welcome uh zubi zubi to make final remarks welcome zubi nice to see you thank you it's great uh, seeing you all thanks and appreciation for the canadian people institutions canadian government churches, as well as Kairos for such continuous support and meaningful partnership. Such a partnership with you has empowered our walk and talk towards empowering women, strengthening gender justice and mainstreaming. Your agape and your sense of justice for the liberation of land and people your rigorous spirituality and advocacy for the rights of all people, nations, and women and girls is an epitome to us and we am. Your unconditional support and love encourage us, empower us, and foster nonviolent struggle all over the world, regardless to faith, nationality, gender, and country. Together, we work for a mosaic culture, as I see in this gathering in the world as well, as to work for diversity and unity as citizens of this global village. As the world marks the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, let us think of the female Palestinian prisoners who are still subjected to cruel and human degrading treatment. Pablo Noredo, Pablo Narodo, 
mm-hmm. says, you can cut all the flowers, but you cannot keep spring from coming. Indeed, no one can keep spring from coming. Do you know why? Because Kairos people, the Canadian people, the governments, and their partnership all over the world keep watering the roots of the flowers through their agape, empathy, and perseverance. The spring will continue to come through you, through your prophetic voice and prophetic action. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zugbi. Always so powerful to hear from you. Um, and now off to our closing, I'm going to invite Rachel Worden, who is the Partnerships um, Manager at Kairos Canada, to, um, to do the thank yous and closing. Rachel. Um, <clears throat> just want to end with a big, big thank you. There, there, isn't, uh, there isn't time and there aren't words to, to thank with justice everybody who participated uh, in, in the event today. Um, but I want to thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart <laughs> um, for, um, for such uh, an inspiring um, uh, event today. A thank you to the, the partners for sharing uh, and the participants for sharing your, your courage of uh, work of courage and transformation and for sharing these stories uh, of such inspiration and resilience and, and tenacity. Um, uh, thanks to the listening panel uh, for your, uh, your reflections and your thoughts and your messages uh, of um, your critical messages of, of hope. Um, thanks to Global Affairs for your support and partnership and ongoing partnership in this program. To all of you um, for your support, for all the participants uh, uh, and all the audience for your support and your solidarity and donation uh, for the amazing team at, at Kairos. Um, and uh, there isn't time to name everybody, but I want to thank, uh, thank you, um, Jane, for such wonderful um, moderation. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you to the partnership team, to, to Gabriella and Jim uh, for, uh, for, for bringing, bringing the partners together. Um, uh, thank you for the te- technology and all the technical support uh, that enabled this to happen to Gabriella again to Giselle uh, to everybody who's recording it and 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 who had a role in this thank you and thanks to the uh, translators uh, who uh, allowed us to communicate and to share stories in uh, four languages uh, and to communicate uh, across the world and and thank you Lee thank you so much Lee Karen, for, for starting us off in, in a good way and reminding us of uh, the history of the land and the history of, of struggle. Um, I, before uh, we close with a, a final video from the South Sudan Council of Churches, uh, I just want to invite Adriana uh, Contreras, uh, our graphic uh, recorder, uh, to, um, to show us a bit of what she's um, what she, how she's depicted our, uh, our event. Here you can um, see it. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you everyone for, for taking, well, for everything that you shared with us today. Um, this uh, image that you see on the screen right now is a summary of some of the final remarks and um, the, what was shared by the listening panel. And two things I want to highlight um, that was kind of like um, a common thread throughout the throughout the the session is um, this idea of planting seeds for change, um, and it was repeated by Marie Claire uh, when she said that it takes one seed for the forest to grow, and um, I was very inspired by a lot of the um, a, a lot of the metaphors that were, sh- by, that were shared by everyone, uh, looking back at the land, looking back at, at nature, the butterfly effect, the ripple effects, the snowball, like n- knowing that that, um, that that power that comes from the land is, is being uh, projected through all of us. Um, I also created um, specific portraits 
um, for each of the for each of the partners. So this will be uh, shared with all of you. So I won't go through all of them, but I'll maybe just give you a sneak peek of each one. Um, so highlighting some of the some of the successes and the power that you that you share with us, um, the strength that has come from from your work this past year or two years um, and something that came across in all of your interventions is is the importance of coming together of um, strengthening the networks of support and something very important that will share as well is how uh, we will not able to reach peace or the peace that we desire if women's voices are absent and I think that's the one that um, that stayed with me the most. And and I think the work that is that is being done by everyone here is to ensure that our voices are heard and that we we can we can really we have a, a we, we as women have a lot of wisdom to share. And and it's important that we all uplift our voices. Um, and I will leave it at that. Thank you again so much for inviting me to be part of this. And. Um, and I'm leaving this session very inspired and looking forward to learning more about your work. Thank you so much, Adriana. Thank you for um, illustrating and, and capturing our uh, our meeting and our work and the work of partners in such a in such a, a, a beautiful and powerful way. And yes, that we will be. Um, we will be posting that uh, and uh, illustration, and we will also be translating it uh, for for in four languages for for the all the partners. Thank you, everybody. That is it. Thank you for joining us today. We invite the partners who would like to. It's not. It's optional. Partners who would like to stay for a debrief um, after this meeting. Um, also, any staff, Cairo staff who were involved in the planning and execution of today, if you want to stay for a debrief, you are more than welcome. Welcome, but it's optional. Uh, we'll be doing quick, you know, 10-15 minute debrief. And everybody else, thank you for joining us.